Hi, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We are officially here. I got my team for this United We Taste. I can't believe it's been six months since I started this. This is kind of crazy. Um, so welcome to all the new faces. Uh, thanking in advance my guests that's here with me. You see, I don't have my, my brother, um, Philippe, with me, but he, he's here with us in spirit, but he's, you know, he's, he's not on the screen with us today. But we get a little, little American love with the Pinot Noirs from Oregon today. And then we have Bruno representing for Portugal. So we got enough Portuguese in the room to keep uh, Bruno um, Philippe alive here. So just to give you some information on United We Taste and who we are, we're gonna start with the intro. So United We Taste was put together by Philippe and I while we were studying. And as you may know, typically you would study with people in the industry in person, do blind tastings. And that's part of the community uh, the wine community experience. And so due to quarantine life, um, I thought let's just do this virtually. And so it started with him and I studying Spanish wines and that turned into us actually inviting people who are in the industry from each country to come into the group and represent. And then we'll learn from each other and everyone just kind of brought in their own wines and we drank new wines in solidarity of that country. So started with Italy, then Spain, and so on and so forth until we start slowly running out of countries <laughs> to talk about that everybody had access to. Um, so this is nice to be uh, focusing on Oregon because this is, uh, I would say, our first time coming back to a location. We kind of moved on to Moscato as a grape and the one before that with Rosé talking about different wine styles, but we're doing a double focus here, Pinot Noir and Oregon. And we definitely have Siobhan here, who's going to be our local representative to keep to that uh, same vibe as before. So without further ado, my name is Cha McCoy, sommelier from Harlem, New York, uh, between New York and Lisbon, Portugal. And I am the host of the show, as well as a wine consultant and wine tour operator. So Siobhan. Hey, guys. I'm Siobhan Ball. I own Hello. a company called Dirty Radish. <laughs> Based out of Portland, Oregon, I split my time between here and France when I can. <laughs> Edie? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Etty and Milk Pie. Uh, so I am originally from New York, but based out of Philly now. Uh, sommelier, um, wine director of a restaurant called Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Philadelphia. Uh, and that's me. Thanks for coming, Regine. Hi, I'm Regine Rousseau, and I am the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Shall We Wine. So we are an experiential marketing company. We write about wine, and we work um, for distributors, importers, and we really target consumers. And last but not least, my repeat offender, Bruno. <laughs> uh, I'm Bruno. Um, I, was, I'm born, I was born and raised in Portugal, been here since 2002. I live in New York City since then. Um, currently the wine director and sommelier at uh, Tocqueville in New York City by uh, Union Square. And currently doing a lot of projects to keep us sane. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah. Let's just start out and do a cheers to our sponsor, which is Spire Collection, who hooked us up with these Oregon uh, wines today. So. Cheers, everybody. Cheers to Ruth. Cheers to Ruth Cheers as to well. Ruth. Join us in the chat. Feel free. Send in your questions. Let us know what uh, Pinots you're drinking or Oregon wine you're drinking. You know, I didn't send anybody any Pinot Gris, but I would have, it was a strong full uh, about to come uh, because the way my heart feels about Pinot Gris from Oregon. So. But in this case, uh, let us know what you're drinking and yeah, let's get started. So Bruno, I was sharing with everyone, we're gonna kind of jump right in with talking about, you know, Oregon, Pinots, and then we're gonna go into like tasting the wines that we have. So um, Oregon, the state, okay? Now I tried to be cute and last time, let's make sure I don't mess this up. I shared my screen. And who knows what you'll get, but <laughs> <laughs> for those of us who, 
<laughs> All right, I, I keep it PG now. Come on now. But... How many times you got to open up let another let girl? <laughs> yeah, here we go. So let's see. All right, let's do this now. I found this important because I didn't realize so many people may not know where Oregon was or had any clue, even people in America, you know, they may have, yeah, I know the state of Oregon, but don't have any idea. So just to give people some context, this is the state of Oregon. It is, is neighboring states are Washington, the state to the north, Idaho, potatoes <laughs> to the west, to the east, excuse me, and just below it is California. And we cannot forget uh, one of the main bodies of water that actually influences the Tawar is uh, the Pacific Ocean right to the left. So I wanted to start here just so we can give people context who are watching in the chat or playing this video back because I think it's more important for people to understand why Pinot Noir and why Willamette and why are people coming from UC Davis here? <laughs> you know, yeah. just need to know where it's at first. Um, so it's in the Northwest and just, let's just take it from here. So we have seven, uh, ABAs here, and the one that you're going to see the most is Willamette. All the wines we're going to have today are from Willamette, and even more specifically, if I can do this, oh yeah, come on, fancy computer. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, it's a little Zoom action. Sooner, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're coming. We're, we're right here in the Yamhill Carton. So uh, this is a unique area, and I think that the funny part, everyone knows Oregon or Oregon Pinots is because they always are comparing it to Burgundy. So I wanted to start with that discussion and then we'll flavor in you know, more specifics about Oregon as we talk about Oregon versus uh, Burgundy. So um, to be clear, the correct latitude lineup for um, Oregon is actually, or Willamette is actually Beaujolais, not, you know, Burgundy. So let's just yeah, let's start, let's start there. Uh, however, there is this context of people associating the two and are they just because they're really great Pinots that's coming from both? Do you feel like this is a place where a lot of people should just have a place of association? Just wanna know what everyone's thoughts are when it comes to was that just a really good marketing? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we made great pinots, like the guys over in Burgundy, you know. Um, did it hurt them? Did it, you know, just want to hear what your thoughts are before we start breaking into some more of this. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great thought. You know, like I believe, I believe that uh I just believe that uh the concept of the, the association of with Burgundy, not only because of latitude, like that latitude, I think it's the 40th parallel yeah. that basically it's around that like the Mediterranean goes even um I think it makes a lot of sense in terms of terroir too like when they have like this complexity of soils they mm -hmm. go from the, the, like basophic soils there's a lot of volcanic there's a lot of fossil deposits so that it used to be a glacier it used to be a, a body of water that would go to Idaho the whole the, the whole place like back in the time so everything that happened for me like yes and mainly to be honest like mainly with Chardonnay I feel like that kind of flint flintiness like that kind of minerality that sometimes I can easily go to uh, uh, to, um, to to Burgundy uh, the latitude the altitude and I think it's a great place it's a I think it's a great um, experiment to experience like and to to try like all the clones and most of these producers we are tasting today, they play with a lot of uh, Dijon clones, like they play with the Pomar clones. I think it's a nice way to express, might be a little bit of a marketing tool, yes. Like, oh, my rosé is Provençal. No, your rosé is from Vigneau Verde. It has nothing to deal with Provençal rosé. <laughs> might be a little bit like that, but to be honest, I think it comes from a good place, the idea. And not only this, a lot of Ameri uh, French producers are going to, uh, to Oregon, and that might be another reason too, right? Anybody wants to rebuttal, Bruno? Do you feel okay. like? Hey. <laughs> no, I think that um, it's this, always this comparison, right? So you're like, 
Burgundy, Oregon, Lamp Valley, whatever. But the real thing is for me, two things. One is, yes, stylistically or like with the terroir, they're very similar. So of course it makes sense to compare them. But I also think that the majority of the Willamette Valley winemakers were inspired by either having Burgundies or being in Burgundy. Most of the folks who have been making wine here um, from the early days had experiences in Burgundy. So that's where the sort of like idea even yeah. came from. And some of those clippings yeah. um, <laughs> came right from Burgundy. Um, we have a lot, of, we still have quite a few vineyards that we call suitcase vineyards because people literally brought them in their suitcases. Mm -hmm. um, I won't name names to get anybody in trouble. But, uh, Burgundy is always going to be the big brother or the big sister. We'll never be like Burgundy because we'll never be as old as Burgundy. So that's where the comparison sort of has to stop. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's where people are getting all of their inspiration. Now you're seeing the flip of that with French people coming to Oregon. Moreover, because they don't have the same, we don't have the same rules as they do in Burgundy and Beaujolais. So they can be, we're the wild west, if you will. So people are having this fun of experimenting with Pinot Noir and a, a very young Pinot Noir. You know, we're only barely into second generation winemakers here in France. It's like, goes back. So the king's yeah. brother was the first winemaker, yeah. you know, it's like crazy. And you're like seeing people's houses and you're like seeing a painting and you're like, who's that? They're like, oh, that's my great, 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 great grandpa. And like, we have like a uh, second generation, maybe. So very different. So it's very hard to compare and contrast, but I think that it's more inspired than it is trying to be like, we're just like Burgundy or we're- common. Well, I think, and that the thing, that's the cool thing for me, because I think obviously you said Burgundy is always going to be that big brother or that comparison. But I think that now I feel like winemakers, especially this new generation of winemakers that are cropping up, like they're kind of like, like well, we don't want to be, burgundy's little brother we want to beat oregon and it's like i feel like a lot of the wines now you see that winemakers are forging their own identities and now it's like you know what does oregon pinot taste like as opposed to like does this compare to burgundy or, or whatever it's just like no what are we doing in oregon and I, I think that that's that's where we need to be forging in general in terms of the united states and in, in claiming our identity and once we we're now figuring out like terroir and like what grows best where and i think that you know, now it's like, you know, the, the comparison to Burgundy has to stop. It's like, now it's like, what is Oregon? What is Oregon tasting mm -hmm. like? And like, and it's so different throughout, you know, just without, within the Willamette Valley. It's exactly. so vastly different. And I think that that to me is the most exciting thing. So. So let me add, I mean, from the marketing perspective, because that's, you know, the work that I do. Mm -hmm. I, I love what you said, Siobhan, and I haven't heard anyone say it. I, I think that we really need to talk about inspired by mm. versus like, or, you know, just like, and, and I yeah. understand it because, uh, you know, you, you, you all made this point that we are new, right? In comparison in terms of a, a wine country, right? So we didn't have the vocabulary to really explain what our winemakers are doing. So we relied on it's similar to or in Burgundian style. And I, I do think from a marketing perspective that we need to change that verbiage. We need to change that language because we do have to give credit to the winemakers and saying, yes, they are inspired by Burgundy, but man, look at what we're doing in our own, uh, in our own regions. And this is the, our own expression. So um, yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, I think this is a good start to truly go into the wines too, because um, that is one way. But then there's also, which was brought up about Burgundian uh, winemakers coming to Oregon. So he is making his own style that he would normally make in Burgundy, but now in Oregon. So then now that's a, now that kind of divides what you just said when you come to American winemaker. Uh, regime, but at the same time, when a, a actual Burgundian winemaker comes to Oregon, is his wine now American Oregon wine, or is it now Burgundian? It is. If, you, if you see it's like Domaine Drouin, if, mm. if, if you see like Drouin, Drouin's wines, mm -hmm. if you taste like Joseph Drouin and you taste like Maison uh, um, yeah, Drouin uh, in, in Oregon, they're different. They're like, the style is different. Like it's all about the fruit in Joseph 
and Joseph Druin, like as opposed to uh, is, uh, is taken um, in Oregon. But at least for, in my perspective with him, like even if we taste a little bit of uh, lingua franca's wines, like, you know, like it's like, it's different too. Like it's not very Burgundian for me. It's not all about the fruit, like in the quality of the fruit. Yes, they, all these producers, when I taste the wines, it's all fruit, 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 but not based upon like the fruit profile that you'd get in, uh, in Burgundy. And right. these guys don't have cascades, the rain shadow effect, like it's super exciting for these guys, like being so fairly square, but like in Burgundy, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Like people expect this and they go to, you go to, you go to Oregon, like, let's do it, let's do it. So, so let's talk about it. As we swirl this first one, because the first one is named after uh, one of the soil types of the area, Walla Kinsey. And Walla so Kinsey. that is another, uh, interesting fact is because when people start talking about oh yeah the tuar is similar and then people are like actually they're not actually the same at all like there's you know the schist soil that everyone loves um silt excuse me that's right in um oregon that people love and it is wild uh, that they love yeah. from this area and it's on an ocean which so it's not this is not fossils this is like actual fish swimming right now and to be more specific, salmon, right? They're very serious about the salmon. Uh, and so, don't kill salmon. So much. <laughs> don't, <you> know, <laughs> so much. Oh, I was like, don't kill the salmon because somebody from don't Oregon. Don't kill them. But, I mean, we just, you know, that's why we love salmon. There's a lot. I mean, that's why we're working to keep, make sure that we have a lot. But you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. But that's what I'm trying okay. to say. Like, they're serious, not about eating it. I'm saying serious people about, like, how I love my dog. <laughs> like, don't kill my salmon, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so, the Willa is, is actually the name of a sedimentary soil. That's actually the, the name, right? Willa Yeah, that is it. Well, this, it's, it's a tribute for Willamette the, and McKenzie. The rivers, yeah. Well, this is named for the rivers. rivers so this is yeah. for the Willamette River and the, and the McKenzie Kenzie. River. Um, and that's, what they, that's why they named it. And it's quite funny that we're starting with this Willa because this wine has been up until 2017, the one we're having has a massive French influence. Mm. It's been French winemakers mm. from its jump. So, I mean, that's one of those things again. <laughs> and this is the first vintage from Eric Kramer. This is the 2017 that we have. So, Siobhan, um, I, I, I'm curious to know your opinion about this. So, I'm a French winemaker, um, Burgundian winemaker, right? Studied in Burgundy, came to the U or came to Oregon, making wine. How do you respond to Shah's uh, question? Is it Burgundian or is it Oregon? In your in your opinion? Again, I think it's like okay. So we went. We kind of talked about the marketing side, but I think you have to speak in like a business way as well. So I'm in Oregon, and I'm. It's the 1960s, and I've got this land, and I want to grow something on it. And I'm seeing that there's a similar terroir to Burgundy. Of course, I'm going to plant Pinot, and that's what they did. They planted Pinot and Chard and Pinot Gris and a lot of other stuff. But as they started to grow, the Pinot was doing the best, right? And it was the, it was a good sell. So why not plant more and more Pinot? Now you're seeing again in this last 10 years of these younger winemakers throwing out a bunch of grapes again. Gamay is huge, Pinot, you know, Pinot Meunier, Trousseau. Like you're seeing people start to be inventive again. And so there's just sort of like the why. Well, yeah, because Pinot is good and it works and it sells, but then there's like this creativity that you have to also have, you couldn't have had if you hadn't had it established that we have great Pinot Noir here. I don't think that it's, I don't go to France and I'm like, I mean, I, when I go to France, like people are like, oh, you're American and you act American. I don't act American in France. <laughs> I act very French when I'm there. So mm -hmm. while a Burgundian micer might be coming here and having some preconceived notion, the fruit is still the fruit and it's still young and you still have got to manage it the way that you can. And it it's never going to taste, like you can open a bottle of Oregon Pinot and a, open a bottle of of you know a Burgundian a Burgundy wine and you're gonna know the difference. They it's just you can't. There's the juice and the fruit is so young because the soil. Perfect segue, Siobhan, because I'm gonna make sure we on time, girlfriend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like I'm gonna shoot out the questions. I'm gonna make sure y'all taste these wines because we won't even get to the wine. Okay. Go ahead and start going through the tasting notes of the Walla Kinsey. Okay. 
I like Willow Kim. Um, so, so really bright, bright, bright cherry, like lots of red fruit. I love that it's so. The nose food, like, is telling face. me like hibiscus, like dried flowers. Hibiscus, right? hibiscus yeah. is like always something that you get. I feel like for me, for for Oregon Pinot, it's like that's like kind of Puts like if I'm doing dried, if you're, dried flowers. Yeah, if you're doing like blind tasting yeah. Pinots, it's like I feel like hibiscus is always the thing that pops out. That's great because at first I thought is it mint, but you, you're right, it's yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like hibiscus dried flowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, elegant. Mm -hmm. So elegant, uh, like the like that. Silky, you know. I love that. There's a little depth to it, but um, I get this like energetic kind of feel, like from beginning to the end. Like there's kind of a power, uh, energy about it. I don't know if I'm still like I'm having the first sips, real sips of wine right now, and it's twelve o'clock for me. Normally, I'm still like, uh, but I feel like energy in the wine. I feel like, okay. And that's something that I would expect as well in an Oregon Pinot. Nice bright acidity. And so that vibrancy that he's talking about comes through. And that's actually part of the reason why I started with this one. Mm -hmm. So I actually, when we'll, as you'll see gradually, if you pre-taste already um, or not, that we're gonna get kind of uh, acidity is kind of what I followed as well as uh, the body as well. So we'll we'll get into some more other styles because I think some people, and for those of you don't, we normally hold the glass up so everybody can see the color and things because we normally don't have all the wines, the same wine. So this is yeah. good that we all have it together. Um, so you can either still, all agree or all disagree. <laughs> uh, but still like that sherry that you were saying, like definitely, but actually can go a little bit to mushroomy, a little yeah, earthiness yeah. to it. I think it's but like, a little bit at the end, gets a little more. Does anyone mushroomy. else, but does anyone else get that like spicy, like it's like that Baking spice, spices, like all spices. The, the lasting, like the flavor like lasts for a really long time, but it's like that back end spice that I, it was just like a little surprising to me. I wasn't quite expecting that, but it's it's great. But I agree. Anybody else besides Siobhan familiar with this uh, wine? Have had it recently or had it? I had it. I haven't had it recently. Like I feel like the I maybe had this probably for one of my like W set classes. Okay. Um, but that was like a while ago. So it's cool to taste. I'm it. glad they spent a nice money on your W. Oh, class. they did in New, in New, uh, in New York. They, did. Yeah. they better hook you up with some good wines. Yeah. I think what's what's really striking to me is that you get all this brightness up front. But I think Bruno mentioned this as it's lingering. It gets to me dark and and, mm. and deep and intense, and mm -hmm. that's that's pretty. Darity, this is this is what like more than a year in oak. It the is spices. French. Yep. French oak, more That's than a year. This probably is the only one I didn't check for sure, but I'll give you the answer because I have the, I knew it would be someone like you here. So I got all the answers. <laughs> I mean, once you get Bruno in a room, you gotta have, you gotta just be prepared, you know. <laughs> um, but this is from the, they started like early in the nineties, correct? What do you mean? The one, yeah, the one. Mm. So yeah, how do you see this brand like compared like, you know, it's not compared like watching like you know like we established in the 90s but in the meantime like we had Ponzi we had a, like all the David Letts like doing this stuff in the 60s like how this how they see this kind of stuff like okay how are we going to start like how, how was for them to start like in the 90s you mean it compared to the other uh seeing like the legacy from the 60s that Ponzi did David Letts did like what these guys did like how these producers like that you how do you see them in the, in the 90s, like reacting, how to establish. I think if I like talk about it compared to other Pinots because um, in Oregon specifically, because I feel like in order to stand like out like this, because remember this was, these were all separate wineries and then Inspire Collection is now one group. So originally they all were their own. And so they had no connection. And now they are a part of a much larger family, if you want to say. And they still allowed a lot of leeway to kind of still do their own thing, which is why people do love what um, when, when Inspire Collection or uh, Jackson Family come involved versus other big conglomerate uh, uh, wine, wine companies because they tend to like take over and take over the formula for it. So we have to take, let's just say, step aside from the big name that it's attached to now look at it as its uh, original, you know, estate 
and I think that's where Chevron is going to be more important. So Eugenie, yeah. Eugenie Keegan is all over like basically this wines, right? Yes. The what? Eugenie, Eugenie, Eugenie Keegan. Yeah. I mean, I think for Oregon, there's like three phases. There was the first, the legacy, like you're talking about, the Ponzi, the Lutz, the Arterberry Marsh, like all the, the, the OGs, if you will. And then there was this re- Thing of the 90s so you had your Willa Kenzie your Brick House your Pinner Ash like there's all these people who came out in the 90s that are I think equally just as like legacy and like steadfast here and now you have this new sort of as of I would say like the like the early 2000s of the young sort of people and it just keeps growing and growing and growing what's interesting about the lineup that we have today is everything is from one ABA so it's all from the Yamhill Carlton which is a very specific soil and space. It's a horseshoe shape. That's what we talk about a lot because it's flanked by the Cascade Range on the west. You've got the Dundee Hills on the east, and then you have the, um, the Shahala Mountains on the north. So everything is south facing, and it's like this perfect range from 200 to 800 feet, and it's this marine sedimentary silt loam soil. So it's just this very like, perfect diversity. little pocket mm -hmm. but it'll be fun mm -hmm. to go through and see how stylistically everyone's so different mm -hmm. even though these are all Insane. once privately owned and now they're all a part of one yeah. big group mm -hmm. to see how they are different with each other and i think that it really just depends on your preference right for why there's so much without the without the, throughout the Willamette valley not just within the avas but then per winemaker because everyone does something different and there's just the microclimates in the Lama Valley it's insane I mean you can literally be standing in one place and being rained on and be looking at a place that has zero rain on it mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Bruno and I know this very well the difference between being in like Centra versus being in Lisbon city center like it's right. it's kind of like somebody's like you had to wear a whole other jacket bring an umbrella like bring camping gear and I literally went probably less than an hour away on an Uber. It was, I don't know, 20 minutes max. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this happens all the time, you know, it's crazy. What would you, what would you guys pair right now if we had to cook something with this right Bruno, now? I'm going to hit you because you know I got to be with the time. We got three, that's all the ones. Uh, oh, wait. And then if I don't talk about wildfires and smoke taint, somebody yeah, will right. kill me. Yeah. So can you, y'all got to let me go. Let me go, please. <laughs> Pierre Ash, let's do it. Pierre Ash, second one. <laughs> I said, uh-oh. Watching your face, you're like. <laughs> That's another question. Uh, we're going to hold all of Bruno's questions to the end of the show. Let me, let me, let me regroup. Yeah. <laughs> Already with the Pierre Ash, I'm like in a whole different yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. And That's completely different. Same so thing. I have all of my. Um, I'm going to let y'all swirl and smell and sip and savor, which I love sharing. Um, How much darker it is as well. The color is darker. Still have this nice clarity to it. Um, the intensity on the nose is not as much as the other, but I let mine now sit out a bit. But the first one was kind of like immediately like flower bomb and, yeah. you know, all like yeah. straight out. Well, the Penner, I feel like the Penner Ash would definitely decant. And I was like, kind of when I opened it, I was almost like, oh, maybe I should go grab my decanter for this just to mm -hmm. like get it to pop out a little bit now. But yeah, but you know, it's good. Getting it's good. good things come to those. A lot those more three. earthy notes on the nose to me. Um, yep. you know, that, it, yeah. Like more a than little a little fresh caramel, roses. vanilla, mm -hmm. uh, caramel, still mm -hmm. vanilla, but I'm getting a little bit of sweet herbs. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's funny because when I nose, I start picking up red lipstick. Like I like oh, okay. these kind of crazy yeah. things out there for people. They're like, what does that mean? I'm like, girl, yeah. my Mac. You know, like you get a nice quality brand lipstick. It has a scent, like the actual lipstick. And I feel like it start coming off um, on it. And I got the earthy notes, more clay mm -hmm. um, on here for me. Like it felt like planter pot, not the soil, the pot itself. Yeah. And I say, I'm going to add a little to your dry roses. To me, it's um, like you said, crushed roses. Crushed but you roses, know how yeah. when, that, when your rose is like you're holding on to it for too long? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah, what, I'm doing. You really know what I'm doing. It's grandma's bathroom. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> 
homemade yeah. potpourri. You done crushed the roses. You done made a little. We call this only have flowers that are sitting here that yeah. have been too long. Yeah, <laughs> Look, I'm sure. I'm sure the people of Oregon and Portlandia would love the fact we're upcycling our roses. You know, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Rose and this one uh, jumped out when I taste on the palate uh, as like cranberry sauce. So oh, it's yeah. funny because Bruno yeah. mentioned earlier about what would you pair with Pinot Noir is like the go-to Thanksgiving hey, Thanksgiving dinner. wine. Yeah, that's right. literally so, what I was thinking. Stuffing, this one was the one for me out of the three. We'll get yep. to the last one, but this was the first one that I was like, "This is the Thanksgiving dinner one." Yeah. I feel like because this I'm, is nice. Siobhan mentioned earlier about the fact that there's so much diversity in even a sub region. So let's keep reiterating yeah. the fact that we're not just talking about Oregon wines or just Willamette. We're talking about one smaller region within Willamette that we're getting already different things that we'll pair with. So we'll talk about parents on the end. But um, let's go ahead and go with the take. Keep going with this the This is the yeah. ones for me where I'm getting the herbs that I use in cooking a lot. So I'm getting the thyme, I'm getting the rosemary and like dried fresh. Like if you took a sprig and put it in your mouth, right? That I'm really, really getting that rosemary thyme from, from uh, this yeah. one. Well, for me too, like in comparison to uh, the Willow Kenzie, like this, the pinner ash is just so much fleshier in texture. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's just like, mm -hmm. it's got like just a lot more going for it. And also like, I don't know, the first thing that popped into my mind is like, you know, like when you have like a really like juicy plum that you just like kind of like bite into, like that was like the thing that like yeah. came to my mind immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's definitely more concentration in the wine, a little more of a tannin yeah. quality yeah. to it. There's yeah. definitely more of a grip. Yeah. It's a little bit more grip. It's still, but it's still, it's still really elegant. Soft and round body, and But you can smooth. still like, but I don't know, you can still get Silk, that like. Silky smooth. Yeah. Silky smooth. But then I, I'm getting like some of this black tea that, you know, like some, yeah. That's the tannins. And I think that's what yep. Eve was mentioning. Yeah. Like the tannins is a lot more gripping here. The acid and tannins, when we're talking about now, the structure of wine is like in reverse of the first. So yep. the other one was a lot more acid and we know Pinot's to be right. more higher in acid. Uh, and then this one, the acid is a, lot, a little bit more rounder, uh, more easier to pair with food. And then the tannins kicking, that black tea. Yeah. you know, that gripping that we're, we're talking about too, so. so I even, to say, even in the fruit, we went from red fruit to blue, black fruit. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I feel like blueberry. Red fruit in the first, fruit now green. it's blue to black fruit right now. So Wild you know, how the first one, the first one made me like you know, salivate the acidity. This one I'm salivating and I'm sucking. I'm like, yeah, you're, like, you're just like, you, you want to chew this wine. Yeah, it's yummy. It's so good. It tastes so like let me the pull the, the bottle. Next. Sorry, to show the bottles. So this yeah. was the Walla Kinsey. This was the first one. And um, I think it's Bruno and Regine who actually posted it on their Instagram. So if you don't see them through the whole shot, you can go right to Instagram and actually see them. So this was the first one we're talking about, Walla Kinsey. And then the one that we're all Thanksgiving in love with uh, <laughs> is, is this guy right here, okay? So I just now, let me add, I'm in love with both of them. Yeah. It's just different, okay? No. <laughs> I'm not choosing. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I said Thanksgiving in love with. Okay. So I, that was very specific. Like, oh. I'm having a menage a trois right here, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm glad Bruno was acting real polite today. So I appreciate that. Maybe it's that <laughs> RGB that got him like sitting a little solemn, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm glad he's not, you know, turned up like he usually is. No, <laughs> I want to see that. I want to see that. I want to turn up, you yeah, know. It's 12, it's 12 30. It's 12 30. <laughs> if this was 4 o'clock, like normally I do my Instagram lives, oh boy. <laughs> no. We don't need him turned up, please. Oh, I want to turn up there. Bruno and I want to see French Siobhan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing too with these wines with that tannin structure is no. that, that that horseshoe is really influenced by the coastal wind that comes through the, the Van Duzer corridor. Mm -hmm. And so knowing where these two places are, I can say that the Penner Ash definitely has a little bit more of that influence. And that's why mm -hmm. there's a little bit thicker of the skins and that mm -hmm. tannin. Cool. Um, but I, I mean, I love Penner Ash though. And I think the style, <laughs> I mean, Lynn, the winemaker, yeah, and uh, it's funny because the first one—that's probably why I didn't even take note on the 
oak or no oak mm -hmm. on the first one because I actually did I if someone told me it was like partially in concrete or stainless steel I believe them mm -hmm. um compared to the, the next two yeah. so this one that I'm having I made sure to take notes of it and it's 10 months and a uh, new French yeah. oak uh, and yeah and she was 29 percent one year uh oh. one year use barracks and then 24 percent in two years mm -hmm. and so when you think of all of this oak they all this new oak contact because the first thing i got on it on the nose and on the palate was vanilla and so i said oh <laughs> what's the oak vanilla that's what i said today. vanilla yeah. caramel yeah. and um nice dark chocolate it was like i want a dark chocolate pairing with this one yeah. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there. Mm -hmm. um, any other last minute? Well, she uh, it just she's the first female winemaker in Oregon, right? Like the yeah, 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 which is really Lynn cool. was, right? from California. He so. was oh, yeah. No. yeah, renowned as a woman winemaker, right? Well, cool. Yeah, and I think that I, one of the cool parts. I beg to like, differ in the sense that all of the wives who were the wives of the original they were, people yeah. were also the first wine absolutely, makers. Absolutely, absolutely. Touche. No, I am making my first wine this year. Yes, I'm like, I'm a wife. I need a wife. <laughs> so I was like, let me, let me clarify. Let me clarify. <laughs> I need a house husband or a yeah, wife I'll or something. <laughs> <laughs> so and I know Rush, my name is from yeah. <laughs> And Benarash, they do, they basically have wines for most of the AVAs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. no, so it's been like all over the place, right? They have quite a few vineyards and per, still possibly. Oh, I don't I mean the other wines. The fruit, the, other, yeah. the, fruit. Right. the fruit comes from. I mean, this, most uh, people, I, I would say, I would. In my mind, I think the most people who don't, who are just a state, are quite like a state as in like they only, this is like one place, but there's many people who own many vineyards and that's all a state fruit. But there's a lot of people who um, in Oregon who are purchasing fruit, if you will, yeah. but they have yeah. um, that high amount of people doing their, uh, they're doing the vineyard management. Mm. So they're yeah. a, really a part of their okay. rhyming, even if they don't necessarily own the estate, they still get to make a lot of the decisions. But I would say that, I mean, you would like to own the estate, right? And this is all estate for you. So. Exactly. I mean, I hope that's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and move to the next one so we can get into some more of these uh, Oregon questions. So I'm going to pull this one out. Grand, Grand Marine. And for those who don't know too, Yamhill Carlton is named after these two towns, Yamhill and Carlton. They're like this big. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't think either of them have an actual stoplight in them. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> like it's really charming. In Carlton, there's like they're really doing big things, but like literally there's a spot in Carlton that you're driving through where you can pull over and there's a little roadside farm stand that is um, honor system. And it's just whatever vegetables and fruits they have out that day on like a really cute little tablecloth. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really quite charming. All right guys, now we're off to the third wine. I love these wines. I have this on my list. I have this in the, in the Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And again, I wow. still continue on the violet. I still con that's still that flowery, perfumey. Yeah. This fresher yes. flowers in this case, instead of that dried hibiscus potpourri, I think now it's more like violet. Like, like yeah, like, if you're in, like, if you're there, like in a field, you know. But hefty. It's so yeah. that you know that mm -hmm. it's about to come when you taste this wine. Just smelling it, I'm like, this is going to be bigger than the last two. Yeah. A little mm. herbaceous, a little, some hints of perhaps coffee or toffee. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will take your toffee for real, for sure. I actually picked up hot chocolate mix. So Ooh, not that you okay. the water in yet, but it definitely has that smell like you just open up a nice um, nest quick, you know, like you just pop it open. <laughs> Swiss Miss. I'm getting more Swiss Miss. Now. Yeah, Swiss let, let, let's Swiss upgrade. Miss. Okay, let's okay, upgrade. hold on. Right? Don't know. <laughs> Swiss Miss versus Nestle. But you get where I'm going with this. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just thought of like, just because I used to eat like the Nestle Crunch as a kid. That was like my favorite chocolate bar. And I just tasted it. I was like, that's what I got. Like that kind of like, I mean, milk chocolatey thing. But 
I definitely see the hot co- like hot cocoa. Or yeah, because it has more of a yeah. milk chocolate versus yeah, the last one gave one. Dark, dark chocolate. Yeah. yeah, and I think that people yeah. when you think of like mocha versus cacao, you know, like yeah. people and that we can easily just sit here and say, oh yeah, I got chocolate on this compared to another grape, yeah. right? This is all pinot. So we're getting like different levels and layers of how the chocolate could be. It can be in this, it can be the chocolate bar, it can be dark or yeah. But I, I, I love what, yeah, I love what Eddie said, Ed, Eddie, am I pronouncing Oh name? yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I, I love what you said with the Nestle because I feel like there's something interrupting the chocolate. So when you remember, mm-hmm. when I remember a Nestle bar that, that rice kind of like broke mm-hmm. the chocolate up and that's what's happening with this to me. Mm-hmm. Now I've had this strange palate thing lately Mm-hmm. But I'm picking up some um, salinity in this. Anybody else, or is that just? Well, oh yeah, I, yeah, hundred yes. percent. It's yeah. something to expect salinity because but of more all that. This one. Positive, positive, more and this in one. all the others, yeah, it's definitely salt here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, make but, my mouth water. Yeah, mm-hmm. I want. I want to. Um, I'm. I'm obsessed with um, bacon. Yeah. So like, I want like a piece of. Um, what is that called? I have like two pieces in the fridge. I like every once in a while it's a pork. No, a belly? Talk. The belly or the pork belly? Pork belly. Pork belly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh no. man. Pork I, belly I, would be listen, killer. With this. Listen, yeah. <laughs> pork I'm going to have a date killers. night with myself tonight. I'm a pork belly. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm a real little pork oh, belly. No. Think of me. Yes. <laughs> she is child. You know, I, I might get dressed up too. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Just to light a I candle. love that. That's amazing. Bacon <laughs> spices, nutmeg, yeah. cookies. There's, there's, even, there's a little leatherish. It's a little leather. Ooh, there's a little, a little leather and sandalwood. A little that's yeah. But yeah, I got this. No, like thinking road. about what I'm what I'm tasting now. For me, like I would go, for instance, like for a mushroom risotto or something like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like okay. having like that more like creaminess, mushroomy, like yeah. fairly decadent risotto, like something like that. I think that this is uh, like the other one could have been more. I think someone called out star anise earlier. Mm-hmm. This one still has this kind of spice bacon rack smell. Like you just yeah. open the cabinet, but it's not sweet. It's more of like, or I'm ready to cook. Like what, what I'm about yeah. to make. It gives, yeah. giving you the. Um, you know, not not baking, but more in this uh, like I don't know a pepper steak. I'm getting like peppercorn, black peppercorn. Yeah. You got there, nice there, spicy notes. There's this really pretty wave of cherry that you can, like yeah. bright cherry yeah. that right up front. Coming through. Yeah. And it, it just keeps going like this. Mm-hmm. Like that's oh, how I, I love that. Is. Yeah, like that. I like I love that. That. Yeah, like I want to swim in it. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> not. Yeah, it's, all right, yeah. Regina. I think they may make it. You're gonna be their new marketing uh, lead. Yeah, <laughs> you, 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 you asked me to come, right? This is how I think about wine. Swimming it. Yeah. I don't know how we add that to the tasting yeah. to make you want to swim in it. No, it's so that. emotional for me. I think about how it yeah. makes me feel and like, right. you know, yeah, it's making me like. Yeah, <laughs> it makes me want like, Ride the like wind. It's breakfast time for me still here. So I'm yeah. like mm, pork belly and a little like a couple eggs. Yes. And, like, yeah, it's fine, right? Breakfast yeah. for right. no, it, it works. Steak and eggs <laughs> yeah, always it, work. You do well, steak and you, eggs. And if we want to keep it real, like New York, it's like bacon, egg, and cheese. Like I think this would be actually really great. That's what that. I had. That was my <laughs> breakfast. Yeah. That's what actually. That's actually what I had. So, <laughs> I mean, mine's just turkey bacon, wine. but you know, you get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's just interesting how the three wines go very differently, like in Absolutely. terms of the pairing. Like right. when I think the Panerash, I think like something more like a, like I don't know, perhaps like still duck or something like that, and then this or a beef stew or something like that. Yeah. Just the tannins on the three of them are totally diverse, and we're talking about very about different. the same AVA. Texture, yeah, texture, like the difference in texture, I think was probably the most stunning to me. And it really just talks like, I don't know, it just speaks to the diversity of the CVA, 100%. Um, I had the opportunity to learn more about uh, the, uh, the the Willamette because uh, Eugenia came in to Tocqueville like last year or two years ago. That's when mm-hmm. I put the ones on the list. And just to hear her talk, it just like got... Everyone shut up, listen, and it's just like right. She's so so she has so much knowledge about not only the region, but she can place this and place that. Like everything that she says about the region, she's just like I wouldn't even think that was nice. That was nice in uh, in um, in Willamette, like the same like the tiny 
the tiny um, uh, small sandy uh, like you find like in Awaka or in uh, okay they okay. have it there too like so they, there's so much diversity in soils and she can break it down just like that it's pretty impressive so cheers to her to yep. her. Cheers, Eugenia. Cheers to Eugenia. thank you Thank I'm you. gonna break into okay. my Q and A period. So if you're following us, you know you may not like switching it up, but it's all about the theme, the topic, and the vibe of everyone. So in this case, I look. We already hit. We're close. We're approaching the one hour mark, and so I want to make sure I start getting some of these questions in. And that was a good segue. That was fast, <laughs> though. We're having yeah, so right? much fun. <laughs> this is see. I told you. That's how people end up here for two hours. I'm like. Oh, <laughs> That Portuguese one still tops everyone. Oh, man. Because I said, I'm never doing something two hours. On this <laughs> um, so rules and regulations, right? So I'm going to go to that first. So I'm going to just keep it topic focused, and then I'll move to a new topic. So if you hear me jump in, just know, guys, I'm here to be the referee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's different because when people think about Oregon as well, there's a lot, or let's say American wines, Americans thinking about American wines. We don't know the difference between anything. So when they want to pee, know that's, oh, I want to, yeah, I want one from America. I want one, you know, I want to support local or whatever the reason is. Uh -huh. And they're like, oh yeah, I want one. Okay, they all buy one from California. They don't know why they should prefer, like I would sell one from, um, from Oregon versus I would probably sell one from um, Napa or Sonoma or Santa Barbara, but there's a reason why I would sell those wines for or serve it at an event or a dinner mm -hmm. versus the ones that I feel more comfortable with selling the ones straight from Oregon. Mm -hmm. now, that's my disclaimer. I'm not saying that those other ones are bad, just that I have reasons behind them. So right. now I don't got time to break it down. That's why you hired me to make the wine list, right? So one of them being this, the laws, the rules and regulations. So Oregon, for those of you who don't know, it's the only state that requires a 90% varietal on the label. So if it says Pinot Noir, it is it has to meet the 90% of Pinot Noir in it. They can't fluff it up like, oh, this one's too flabby. Let me throw a little more love, you know, just to give it that herbaceous note that I need. Or let me throw, they could put a little bit, literally a little bit, because it only has room for 10%. Mm -hmm. um, but the other grapes that, you know, or I'm sorry, the other states, the AVA allows up to 75% yeah. of, in this case, Pinot or whatever grape you see lo um, located on the label. Is that a bad thing? No. But if I'm trying to teach people about Pinot Noir, which I'm trying to do virtually right now on, um, you know, these virtual wine tastings we're doing, et cetera, is that it's hard for me to do that when I don't know what that other 25% is. So mm -hmm. it's easier for me to start stylistically with the Oregon one, even though there's some varieties here between them. And just wanted to hear what's your thoughts on kind of Oregon Pinot versus other, let's move um, Burgundy or France out the way and say against other American wines or even other New World wines that's out there. Um, thoughts on that, thoughts on the rules and regulations. I mean, there's more than the 90% for those who don't know. It also has to meet a 95% of that vintage rule and also has to be 100% of the location. So mm -hmm. that's really strict, you know, when it comes to Oregon, <laughs> yeah. uh, for those who are not aware that, oh, okay, I didn't even know I should ask these questions, but it has a lot to do with, I serve people, the first thing they come in and say is like, I only like Pinots from here. And then you're like, well, actually the grapes is from like five other places. It actually is not all Pinot, got a, you know, 15% of Merlot in there. And they're like, what? And it, like, it's almost like I was the one who told them Santa don't exist. So I just, I just kind of want to hear your thoughts about Oregon taking a stand um, for making these rules and regulations um, about their grape varietals and labels. Well, let me respond this way, and this might not be the, the answer that um, you'd like. I, I think from a consumer's perspective, um, sometimes it gets too daunting, right? What we need to know as people who are in the industry versus what we need to communicate to consumers, I feel like we have to give information in chunks. So I, I think what's really important for me is to talk about what I like about the style versus comparing it to another region. So when I think of Oregon, like it was my first introduction to um, American Pinot Noir, right? Because okay. I 
I, I worked with a, a distributor that represented, you know, Domaine Duran, Domaine Serene, like very early on. So that's what I talk about. I talk about, you know, this was my first introduction. Um, I talk a little bit more about, to me, my experience with uh, Oregon Pinots, there's just this real elegance to it. It's, mm -hmm. um, I find them to be a little, you know, if I'm being very sort of basic, a little drier than, um, than some of the California ones that I have. But mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like sometimes we, we try to give too much information to the consumer and, and then it, it th then they feel overwhelmed and they feel like well I can't even explore this category because I have to know all of these rules that mm. that's just but my take the rules though as a consumer right so uh, talking to you as professionals we know the rules and if you yeah. didn't know and this is your first time hearing it I'm letting you know uh -huh. but at the end of the day once you know you go oh that's probably a big difference between Oregon versus I don't know, Washington or yeah. um, forget California. California. So just, yep. just understand that once you know, it's kind of like you never go back. Like it's kind of yeah. like once you know, yeah. you can't unknow the fact that yeah. Oregon has taken a stand to say, yes. no, we want our, because uh, Pinot Noir is a very finicky grape and the fact that it takes on the terroir wherever it's at. So if it's in a bad place, it's going to need a lot of help. Bad. So yeah. if it's in a good place, it's doing great. And so that's what, you know, David from um, UC Davis, when they all came up there and realized like, oh wait, I think we, we struck gold here. You know, we got like a second gold rush going on when they start planting the Pinot Noir, because mm -hmm. I think that this allowed them to explore the terroir and be able to be, you know, we're strong about this. You know, I, I joked about the Portlandia yes. idea, but it's kind of like that, you know, that farm to table. We want to know where our chicken came from. We want to know where this Pinot came from. What's the person who made it? You know how close was the ocean and then they stand mm -hmm. by that because they're like you know what we need to under put that on our label we want everybody to make that clear so this goes back to what you just said is because now the other states get to fluff in other things and now the consumer is the one that's confused okay right well, in my mind though that and i respect oregon for that decision right so you know, if from a marketing perspective, I could, you know, you could say pure, right? There's a, maybe a more of a purity to Pinot Noir because we're talking about 90%. But in my mind, is that a stylistic decision or is that a decision that's made because it's better? I, that, that's, that's the part of it that, that makes me sort of sit back when your, your question makes me think, well, are you asking, is, is this better or is it just a style, a decision that the region has made? I, I don't the region, have I mean, that's, the region has made that, sorry. So just to yeah. make that clear, that is the rule. But that's no, the rule. I, I, I know, I know, but I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you're asking, is one better than the other? And I, I don't yeah, think professionally. that- Professionally, I'm not asking consumers, I'm asking I you. It, uh, I don't think it is, right? Me. That's my answer. My answer is it's, it's, it's a decision mm -hmm. and it, it's a decision and you understand the decision and it represents the wines are will show up differently um that that would be my answer let's let's okay. let's not forget about one thing like not necessarily not only in order for us like to pass along the message to the consumer a lot of times we need to understand like the Willamette and, and Oregon are, is still a nursery to play with all these Dijon clones for instance like Grand Moraine, they do a great job with that. Like she, she told me that. Eugenia told me that playing like with triple sevens, all like Tomar, like all the, 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 the yeah. 115, 114, all of these varietals. I did this at Lin, uh, Linmar Estate. When you're tasting uh, separately, the, uh, the, all the, the, the Pinot Noir clones, it's impressive. It's impressive, all these wines. So like for us to understand like why you put like that clone on over that hill like because why I put that clone over like in a in a valley that mm -hmm. explains a lot of sense of place to the region itself mm -hmm. that for me like what I've been understanding try to tell my customers like in a, in the most like basic uh, way. easier way it's the sense of place you know like when you when I'm tasting like um Dundee Hills like for me it's like more like red fruit very bright fruit for me at this point for I've been uh, learning about the nursery that it is Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. When I think about uh, Mc McMinnville, I feel like more of the plummy or that little harder Pinot Noir. Plummer, uh, herbi uh, like, uh, I'm more herbaceous. You're more herbaceous. Yeah. And Mc it's Mendoza, fascinating yeah. with the, all this diversity that all these AVAs, they can play like differently and showcase like the nursery and all the experience experiments 
that Pinot Noir is still going. And I think that's that's uh, exciting for me. It's exciting for the consumer. Like, continue to taste. Like, you know, like, try that, try that. Like, you know, I think they're going to understand the sense of place that Willamette is right now in Oregon is right now. Instead of, like, the rules and regulations that the consumer needs to know and we need to know, I think it's more the sense of place. These AVAs are very different from each other. At this point, that's what I've learned from my tastings. Mm. I think I also it's forward or against it. Feeling, it, but I think it's also for clarity. Like we need yeah. to understand because you're talking about um, how you're distincting these places. Young Hill Carlton's been around for 15 years. It's not that long. It's young. It's a tiny baby. It's young. So it's a nursery. 15 years of like making wine here in a specific exactly. ABA. You're and you're already seeing too that the climate has changed so you don't know how these things are going to exactly. taste from one person to the next and we're the only people who are really able to hone in right now in this particular time about clones if you go to burgundy and start talk, talking to them about clones they kind of look at you like hmm okay exactly. because they've had their grapes for so long and they mutate so it could have been Dijon or it could have been this but now it's like a Somewhere. mutation version of that whereas here we're very specific about which clone and where but you're still seeing new AVAs popping up and sub AVAs so we're still distinctly bringing down even these these the Willamette Valley to now AVAs to sub AVAs to vineyard whereas like in Burgundy you're like oh it came from that vineyard you know exactly Still what it's going to be like. yeah so that's kind of the fun and that's why I like the fact that we have this clarity sake of 90 percent and understanding that these grapes came from this specific place because we're still in this learning process and we yeah. still need to be able to do that but with a little bit of rules just like <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, I think for me, it's just like just having that to be able to study it, like the fact that you can taste like clones side by side and like you have that like distinction there, uh, the purity of the fruit, it being 90, 95 percent. Um, I think for as professionals, for me, it's like, OK, it's a great I know I can trust an Oregon wine to like get that sense of place and, and understand how, how Pinot Noir works. You know, and there are places like that in California too, but you know, you can go buy a VA, but really you kind of have to- Russian River. Russian River, yeah. And like, I mean, for me, Sonoma Coast Pinot is my favorite, uh, but I mean, I think it's really, you're, you're going more by, I think by a state and who the growers are. And I would just say about the Russian yeah. River because like the nurseries that they're doing in Russian River, like playing yeah. like with the, with the clones, yeah. I think it's fair that some similarities with the yeah, lemon. Yeah, no, they, they're doing that like they're trying to understand like which clones are yeah. better suited for this and this and this right but yeah I but like it's i guess it's, it's it's super important i i and i 100 percent agree with you but i think in terms of just oregon and and just having those rules established i think in a sense as being a professional there's a little bit more trust in you know what they're doing and knowing like, okay, exactly. like, I know that this is going to be mostly Pinot and probably most, and most obviously in most of the states that we're, they're tasting, it's a hundred percent Pinot. I feel so it's, you know, again, it's just like that trust factor uh, for me, but yeah. yeah. I, mean, we both, I mean, we all had mixed answers, but I think that the majority is agreeing. And I think, I, which I was basically yeah. trying to make clear earlier is that once we educate, then we can sell. So right. the, the easiest part is that the the because or well, besides Siobhan, so like she's making wine now, but the, 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 yes. us who are not making wine, <laughs> um, then it's like if you're not making wine, then the easiest way for us to sell the wine to people, whether it's in marketing, whether it's on the floor, whether it's in the wine shop, is the more clear they make it for us. So the winemaker or the ABA has made it crystal clear that this is the rule then I don't have to second guess. I don't have to read your tech sheet to see what other 20 different things is involved here because right. the, for the area, I don't have to second guess. It's Oregon, it says it's from Willamette, it says AVA. I already know it's gotta be 90% at least. So I feel strong if someone's like, oh, Cha, I'm in a wine shop, I've never been in. Or I'm looking at a wine list I've never worked with. Oh, mm -hmm. Cha, what do you suggest? And I'm like, oh, a Pinot, which one? I'm like, uh, go to the Willamette. Uh. Right. ABA because I know for sure that one's 90%. So I feel strongly in my suggestion versus the other 10 that may be on the list. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's when we get to a level that's that way, you know, that's something a little bit more. And I don't want to put more rules because I think that's the reason why I do love 
some of the um, like Portugal or um, underestimated wine regions that I do talk about is because some places have less rules. And so there's this room for growth, like Chile, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so you get to like play with it, but let the winemakers who's doing that do that. But then the ones who want to be strict and be in the DOC and the AVAs, they're the ones that we're like following through. I just realized. Yeah, I never this is a, this my is a, it's, it's a great conversation. <laughs> I, I, I want to, I'd love to explore this, like, because I'm, I'm seeing it from a different perspective. It's not right. for me about being right or wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm here to, to understand, but I see it from a different perspective. But I, I love this conversation. I, I appreciate the insights. Mm. I think Siobhan started turning up the heat. And um, I think is this is it come to the point where we must start talking about wildfires, okay? Yeah. So um, it was a you know a bold moment, I guess, putting wildfires right on like boom, we're going to talk about wildfires. Like, oh, <laughs> she yeah, needs wildfires. Wine. <laughs> <laughs> woo, woo, yeah, turn yeah, pour use of all wine. You see who everybody's going for too. It's funny, uh, but I really wanted to take this moment oh, as I was in my charger to basically uh, get people to understand, and I'll let Siobhan, you lead just kind of what it's like living in Oregon while there's wildfires, while I do that, and then by the time I come back, then hopefully I can start with some questions. So if you can just kind of give the lay of the land sure. personally, not just you and why and just you living in Oregon and what you actually see, because the photos that we see um, is obviously disheartening, scary, and I think we may think the entire state of Oregon is orange now, and I know that's not the case. So I'm gonna let you go ahead and just tell people life in Oregon today. Be back. So I do live in Portland, Oregon. I live close in, so I'm like 24 blocks from downtown or city center um, on the east side. So the West Hills is on the west over the Willamette uh, River. And then that goes out to the coast. So, um, mm -hmm. Forgive me if I get emotional because it has been a very rough week. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's been awful. The air quality is, and I'm from here. So I've lived in the Pacific Northwest pretty much my whole life other than the times I've, I live in France. Um, and so I grew up here. I've seen this kind of, you know, the weather here, the climate. It is never, this was off. This mm -hmm. was just there's no other word to describe. It was awful. It's still, the air quality still isn't great, especially for a place that gets so much rain and has so much uh, green and trees. It, it's unprecedented to see this and to feel the depression and the anxiety and the uncertainty and the stress of a collective of people and your industry and your friends and your neighbors has been very trying. I don't feel like we knew or know how bad things are going to be, like what the effects of this is. We won't know for some time. Um, but it's today, there was sun for a moment. <laughs> and there's been rain the last 24 hours. Um, but it, it definitely has taken its toll. So as far as like the living conditions, really can't go outside, windows are shut, um, we're closed in. It's been thick, the smoke just even in the city. Um, I ran away to the coast yesterday or a night ago um, just to get a breath of fresh air. My chest has been tight, coughing, um, really difficult to breathe, very, very hard with a headache, um, trying to drink lots of water and tea and have herbs um, boiling in the on the stove just to keep the air sort of moist um, to see that our air quality was the worst on the planet that it's ever been like is devastating and it really you felt it um, before this call I talked to a lot of winemaker friends and I myself am doing two projects in the Lamont Valley uh, this year uh, winemaking projects that I'm very excited about, but nervous about as well. And um, it's been really hard to hear just how devastated these farmers are and winemakers and how after just the insanity of the year to have this happen right at harvest. Yeah. 
I mean, we had people try before it got really bad when the, when the smoke first started rolling in, it was right when harvest was really supposed to start happening. And I know for sure there were people who were trying to have their, their workers out there. And we had for sure at least one person pass out from the smoke and they had to stop. They had to stop picking. What also happened is that smoke coming in cooled the, the, the temperature like dramatically. So this one week that we were supposed to be having of ripening just sort of slowed. And now we're looking at a bunch of rain. So we're having to make these like crazy decisions. Do you yes. pick now yeah. while it's still under? For me personally, I'm doing two projects. One of them is Gamay Noir. And when I looked at my Gamay maybe a week and a half ago or so, maybe two weeks now, I was at 17 bricks mm -hmm. and I was ready to pl start picking it uh, um, somewhere in the week of the 24th. But I was planning on the 24th because the the ripening week was supposed to be like in the 90s and it was gonna be like, oh, this nice, really great ripening week. It was gonna be super warm. And then the 24th, between the 24th and the third would be when I would pick. But now everything's cooled. I'm going out today to see what the bricks are. What, what and number were you looking to achieve? I was hoping to achieve at least 22, 23. Um, the, these grapes are coming from the Eola Amity, so even closer to that coastal wind coming in. Um, south. But I know, yes, even further south than, than Yanho Carlton and, and west. Um, and so I, I, I think it's interesting that we tried the 2017 this, this time around. 2017 was when we had the Columbia Gorge fire. Yeah. 17 then, was bad for everyone. One, yeah. yeah. Josh is in was... Portugal. Josh is in Portugal, 17. We had, there was fires from basically June till October in Portugal, which is unprecedented. It, yeah. Everything just happened like that. 17 was bad, like all over the, the world was chilly. Everyone, California. These wines are delicious. They're, They're delicious. delicious. Yeah. So it's hard to say what the smoke taint is going to do. Probably I think it's happened. like a real challenge for everyone this year to see what they're going to do. I think it's more just like, um, I'm excited to see what they can do. What I've always loved about Oregon and or Oregonians, and I I hate to be cheesy about it, but we really do have this like pioneer spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, I would not have made it on the Oregon Trail for a various amount of reasons. <laughs> yeah. But again, so you are in Portland, you are all the way up, but most of the yeah. fires like east to the to the Willamette Valley, like close to Eugene and stuff like that, like right, like Eola, uh, it's more uh, like no. towards that. Uh, they're making no. their way up. No, the they're, they're making their way up now. Well, there yeah. was a really massive fire on a, at an area called Bald Peak, which is at the um, sort of northern part of the Lamette Valley. So you're talking like Shahala Mountains, Parrot Mountains, so it's like going up. They're really close in Newburgh. I mean, people were evacuated. I was in the Van Duzer corridor when the yeah. smoke really started rolling in, and I was evacuated from where I was. The suburbs and, outside of Portland, they were evacuated. Yeah, I mean, like, it came to all the really way, way up. up. Yeah. No, it came really close to us. Like people living less than 30 minutes from me were evacuated. Um, and we were, we were at a level two of like, have your bag ready to go. Um, it's, it's been bad, but I think that what's hardest is like the, the people who are being affected and having to make these really tough decisions. And then just not knowing, there's no knowing of what the smoke taint is going to do and what it's going to taste like until we start the process, which is hard to do when you can't breathe. You know? I heard I heard some oh, producers are sending like samples or stuff like that, like to California or to yeah. Davis. Davis is like watching. You have the money to seeing do how that. is that going? <laughs> yeah. The so last listen, I wanted to go right back now. a bit. I wanted Siobhan yeah. just to kind of like give us a personal um, experience of just living in it since the rest of us is more about reading it, you know, and just kind of now just give people who don't know what we're talking about, you know, besides seeing the photos, some context here. Um, so in California, they have the Hennessy wildfires. And it was funny because I was about to say it has nothing to do with cognac, um, just so people can know <laughs> that this has nothing to do with Hennessy. And it actually made me start looking up like, how the hell they even got this name Hennessy. And so 
just a point of clarification, Old Names for Wildfires is, is actually from where it's located. So it actually is on a road named Hennessy that um, now the, if you Google it, the Hennessy wildfires stem from. So mm -hmm. just want to put that out. So there. remember like Riverside <laughs> fire, like right, something like that, like fires like the, a few days ago, Riverside fires like in Oregon? Yeah, Riverside, Santa, Santa Ma, um, the Bald Lion's, uh, Lion's Head, Lion's Head. Yeah. Lion's Head, Bill, yeah. Why? Bruno, I don't know if you realized here, I'm sure you've been here long enough so you know that everything we have has a name for some reason. So it's like the, in, you know, Wind Emilio and, you know, Hurricane Katrina, you know, everything has like these names. Name. So they don't have a reason. So I was like, well, how did they get to Hennessy? Because it's, it's next week vodka, you know, like, I don't know why, like, what's the theme of this? So I did my own little research to figure out <laughs> what's going on, you know, yeah. um, you know, before we have the Belvedere, you know, floods or something. So, oh my God, don't, so don't. I just had to look that up. So just anybody who else who may have been ignorant like me to wildfires, you know, like how do wildfires get their name? That was just that point of clarification. Mm. Now, well, how do they start? In this case, yeah. a lot of people think someone like did a s'mores and the next, you know, a whole, you know, all these trees lit up. Um, and yet they don't understand the context that where climate change actually come into part here. And so this is the same whether we're talking about Oregon, Washington State, and California, or the nice long documentary I just finished watching from the New York Times on Australia. So which happened in January of this year with some of the most unprecedented fires that happened in 20, you know, this year yeah. as well. So just understand this um, lightning that happened is a dry lightning. And so the climate change of being so so much heat in these regions that now they have dry lightning. So there's no rain. It's just no thunderstorms. This is literally right. dry lightning happening. Mm -hmm. And it catched something. In this case, it catched an electrical um, hole in California. And then that's how the fire literally, that was like literally like striking the match. And it caught onto trees and it continued to grow these bushfires and it continued to move north. So in this case, just giving folks who are just kind of like channeling in, you know, and it just looks like a bunch of like really cool orange photos, you know, understand that this is like not devastating farmers, devastating homes, vineyards, and air quality of people who work and live there. And so no matter what state you went or country, like I just brought up with Australia. Um, and we just need to have some type of humanity part of this. And it doesn't mean all of us go over there and go like take care of people. But the decision that Siobhan just said, I, that's why I interrupted, is because now it's up to winemakers, small wineries, small farmers, and big ones. Big ones have more play, like to do what Bruno just mentioned. Small guys don't have the option. They may go, no, we're making this wine. <laughs> like, we're, I yeah. can, I, I'd rather just- Are we making sparkling wine all of, all of a sudden? Yeah, we're, I'm, either you, you may take the gamble um, versus risking all your yields and throwing the whole thing in the trash, right? So we're having this discussion which I open the floor up to now, more so just to understand or just have clarity for people to kind of take in what are the different ways or different reasons why someone would still make smoky wine, not smoky like my last adorable, I mean, you know, I just had smoky in the way where it's a uh, smoke taint possibly. Like, cause someone's like, oh, if it's bad, won't you just throw it out? You know, like you, you know that there's smoke, you know, in the air, but some people can't afford Board that. To do it. Oh, I'm sure Siobhan, you may have taste through more. She just realized that in 2017, that was a lot of, um, there was wildfires then. And if you didn't notice from when I showed the bottle, all the ones today that we described, that some of you are saying in the comments, wow, sounds so delicious. That was also a wildfire year during the yeah. same period. Yeah. So you don't know what you're going to get is what she's trying to bring up. Because this is a great example of, um, here goes some great delicious wines. Here, I don't get any smoke tank. And smoke tank is when the actual smoke is now, you know, grapes is made out of water. So it's actually being fogged up with the smoke and it actually seeps into the grapes while it's on the vine. So imagine um, crushing that and making juice from it. So yeah. um, go ahead, Siobhan, I'm gonna let you cut in. I just wanted to kind of give that kind of historical context. No, I, I think that the thing that people have to understand too is well, a couple of things. One, with the breathing and the just being out here, it's not trees that are just burning. These are people's homes. So you've got, insulation, mattresses, plastics, like there's a lot of toxic stuff in the air. So that's what's making it really difficult and also just like depressing. But also to this year in Oregon, I mean, I'm, I'm excited for the 2020 vintage for so many 
reasons, but it is going to be interesting to see what comes out of it because this is also a low yield. Like the yields are so low, like you're going to see very little wine coming out of Oregon. So if it, if you see a wine for 2020, it's going to be amazing. What do you think has been this drought compared like to other, other, other years? It wasn't the drought that, that caused the low, it was the, it was the, the spring. It was the wet, wet spring that caused wet all spring. these low yields. Yeah, we had a really wet spring. And so the yields, I mean, I'm seeing, I'm hearing from people and for myself. So I was planning and I, this is a winemaker moment right now. You're seeing unfold in front of your eyes. I said, I was said yes to two tons of Gamay from Eola Amity. Now it's one and a half tons. I haven't seen the fruit. I haven't seen it since two weeks. I don't know if I'm going to actually use it. I don't know if I'm going to actually make the fruit from that wine, especially because I have a second project now. I'm very excited about. But um, it's it's a big decision to have to make. And I'm I'm talking about two tons, two baby tons, and everybody else is dealing with like hundreds of tons. You know, like. It, my little thing is so tiny to have to make this tiny decision in comparison to these people who set their, their whole livelihood and all things. And that's not even including talking about like just the other farmers out here. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an interesting time. We'll get through it as we always do. Um, but it's, it's going to be an interesting, I'm excited. We start, I mean, people have harvested already. I start next week with working and we're just doing this. As yeah. we all have been doing in 2020, like. Uh. <laughs> um, at, at what point will you make a decision? I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about the economic impact, right? You have this fruit, you're committed to it. You're going to do something with it. And then some people may be in a position where they can't. At what point do you make that decision as a business person? So I never want to leave anybody in the lurch. So that's my first thing. I want to honor my commitments, honor things. Um, but as a first time winemaker, it is a huge decision to make. And again, it's only two tons or a ton and a half of wine, mm -hmm. but it's like, how much time do I want to give to it? And now I have this second project that just sort of arrived in my lap that I can't say no to. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me, it's today. I'm, I'm driving out to the vineyard today. Um, I 100% adore Mimi Castile and she has a very like, right? And she has a very, um, you know, holistic approach. And so she just really has been guiding me and telling me to like, you know, you go, talk to my, go talk to my grapes, go have yeah. a conversation, like go look at them, go taste them, go see and like touch them and feel them and be in that space. I obviously haven't been out there because of the smoke and now I'm going to go and I'll make that decision based on what I find hopefully in the next you know today and see what they do because like i don't know what the cooling has done to them like if they're still around the same bricks we have rain coming next week can they hang through october i never thought i'd be that like, what time in oregon yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Do you... what's the normal time for oregon well who do you have um like who's going to be picking with you so you're going to go out there today you're going to be like if it's ready to go, what, like how you're just gonna, I'm gonna go woo woo them. And yeah. Like, woo -woo babies, what do you need? What's going right. on with you? Yeah. What's happening? What happened? Are you okay? I'm gonna Jacob. snap. <laughs> yeah. It's almost time. It's almost, it's almost time. time. Yeah. You just have to. And then, yeah. I mean, I'm doing this project uh, for myself, this Gamay project. And then I'm also doing a project with Irie Vineyards. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I'm on call. So Jason Lett is telling me that it might be tomorrow. It might be right. Monday. We're taking Pinot, for my project, it's Pinot Meunier. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything's just sort of like this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't have the air. We don't know. Um, but I, I, I have to make these decisions in the next seven, seven days. Well, no matter how it goes, I'm very excited when for you. to taste them and I know, like, I feel like, yeah, there's just, I've met a lot of, like, 2020 is going to be a really incredible vintage just because of all the strife and, like, hardship. 
of right. the year. I mean, and, and I, and I think out of, you know, just like out of vines that have to struggle to make beautiful fruit, I, I do feel like out of this struggle, like there will, yeah, there will be beautiful wine, you know? So make these vines were like, we don't want to see you. Like, we are so glad for COVID, like, please stay away. And then these things happens to them. I'm like, yeah. can, you, can you give us a sneakers or something? <laughs> it, shows yeah. the, it shows you the resilience of Oregonians. Yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, that's why I think that, again, that pioneer spirit. I mean, there's a lot of people in this valley who you can talk to who talk about like their generation of whatever, and it's like some pioneer. And like hearing about these stories about people on these wagons and these, I'm like, I can barely get through a day if the $20 exactly. in my pocket. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so people do it. And I think that's going to come through especially for 2020 you're going to really see yeah, who so what can we do i mean can't is there anything? that's a good question oh, yeah let, let, let me go <laughs> remember i'm, I'm the top <laughs> let me let me jump in here because i'm going to leave there but i want to say this one congratulations early to you siobhan um we're sending you much love and anything that we can do to you which i think that's where she was about to jump in let us know now you have extended family for those mm -hmm. of you who um, and everybody that's watching, go follow Dirty underscore Radish and actually like see how you can help what Siobhan's doing for her projects, okay? Especially mm -hmm. for Siobhan. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the larger scale, what can we do? Which was going to be my next question, but it was actually going to be followed up with another interest in fact. We talked about air quality, uh, the normal like unhealthy air quality. So AQIs, you have to actually check. When I talk to winemakers, this past week from California, mainly, it was the same idea. Like, okay, we're coming in at 300. Unhealthy is 100. So just give that an idea. So now they're in a hazardous level. This is not regular, oh, <laughs> this is like literally I'm developing yeah. asthma and like, you know, full on. I can't breathe. I'm in, you know, bars. Yeah. Kind of like effect. And so imagine people picking grapes during this time, period. So let's take a moment to understand and if you ever worked harvest, you will know this is not easy work, you know, um, you, your back breaking work, not fun, not glorious. It's cute for that one picture on the gram that I put up. And afterwards, I'm just like, <laughs> like, like back and forth, back and forth, right? That's it. So just, admit, and I'm already out of breath from that and taking breaks and need lunch in between, you know? So just understand that there are a lot of undocumented workers who are doing this type of work. A lot of, uh, well, even if they are documented, uh, immigrants who are working in this region from Mexico. And so the decision to work it or not has become the shaming of vineyards who are allowing people to work, which obviously some vineyards have made a stand on, they are coming, they want to work. So I, I just want to take this moment to make that, uh, make, it, make it a little bit more humane, especially because I have a mother who dealt with anxiety and all types of things and worked three jobs. I'm sure people go, yeah. you, know, you need to just take off. And then you're like, I have two kids to feed. Like, right. so, they, so I have to like put myself in this context and maybe people who didn't have to grow up struggling like that don't have to think about totally. it. My mother will put her own health at risk to make sure I'm at the best school, have new clothes and eat, you know, and have a shelter. And so I can only think of the same way someone that is undocumented um, or even Mexican working there um, on low wages and realizing, no, my kids got to eat. Can you let me work? Like, so right. you can't just blame the winery too. And I, I'm not, again, there may be a lot of wineries between California and Oregon and Washington that is kind of like, you're going to lose your job if you don't work. Now that's, that's something different. But then the ones who are, you, you say, oh no, I, winemakers saying, I tell them, no, you guys don't got to come in. This is the air is just too bad. I don't want you to work. And they're like, no, we want to work. Like, please, because we need to get paid. So they have to make a hard decision on, do they have the money to still pay them so they can go home? Or do they don't have the money and therefore they're just going to not work for you. But then you have the risk like Siobhan, mm -hmm. Siobhan the winemaker hat, you know, like you said no to them. Like, oh, I want to like, you know, it's not good. You guys shouldn't work out there. And they're just going to make the decision to go somewhere else and somebody else is saying, yeah, come guys, come pick here. And now your grip yeah. is at risk because you made the like humane decision or moral choice. So I just want to throw that out there. I will conclude this or at least say by saying um, I have been collecting in, in my smoke tank post that I put up. I asked folks to DM me references um, that they know of that have been helpful to 
helping this that type of work because this is very unique, right? We're not just talking about shaming or canceling wineries or making people to work. Now that's just bad. But the people who know they need to work because they just need to, you know, COVID's already been hard. We just described quarantine, all these things going on. They just need work. And so we have to have some kind of grace for the people who are deciding to still go out there and put their well, own lives at risk for their sure. families. Yeah, well, I mean, I so. think it's what's the, I mean, I think it's really about getting them supplies. And I actually want to shout out, shout out like Dana uh, from Bar Norman. They did right? a raffle. They did an incredible raffle for like mass. They raised like a, a shit ton of money um, to get mass out to, you know, people that needed them that was working in the fields and things like that. Just like making sure like people have what they need, like, you know, having the N like 95 mask and stuff. And it's just like, I just thought like that was so amazing. And just to see like people just rally together and, you know, community, you know, and really taking care of your own, you know, I thought that that was great. And I really think it's just like, you just need to have that kind of spirit and being like, you know, what are the tools that you need for the people that do have to work? You know, um, that to me was the biggest thing. So I just want to shout them out because I thought that was so incredible. Let um, me just ask you, Siobhan, like on that note, like how are the, um, the programs, like in terms of, um, you know, uh, sustainability of getting workers, like, is that like, does uh, Oregon State like work has like uh, programs like by like the way like California does like by trying to source like having visas like getting um, be, uh, workers coming from Mexico that normally have like three three uh, three months or something they can work in the vineyards. Does Oregon has like some some kind of a program like that like giving visas to uh, Mexican workers for that or is that difficult? That's not really like heavy because like the agriculture here is so big and so great and there's a lot going on i would just say to sort of like encapsulate all those things there's two organizations that i absolutely adore i typed them into the chat for you i say it's like i just think that ivoy and salud are doing the most yeah. right now for those workers, really they are, yeah. they're incredible the programs that they've put together and I think it's like kind of on an individual basis I think it's been too long mm -hmm. that Oregon hasn't mm -hmm. had these because for sure for sure for sure when you go back to these legacy um, winemakers and um, that that 90s group that we were talking about some of these people have had the same vineyard management people working in those vineyards mm -hmm. as Ivoy calls them vineyard stewards for 20 or 30 years. So having programs like Ivoy and Salud that like offer these incredible services for, for the workers, for the stewards of these vineyards is like making my heart sing. Mm -hmm. And definitely people are just doing that decision of like, do you wanna work? Can we work? How can we do this safely? Um, like I said, the second that something went down, people were like, screw it, we're not, picking like our people are more important mm -hmm. and I think that you see that across the board in Oregon I don't think there's enough of that sort of programming and happening with our agriculture workers far beyond far uh, vineyards we're talking about also like farming for food and things yes. like that but I definitely see that these two organizations Ivoy and um, Salud are leading the way in that and like making massive changes to what's going to happen in Oregon but I mean again, you, you're making these tough decisions as to, because mother nature, if you didn't know, doesn't quit. Yeah. <laughs> the grapes, the grapes. Right. she's like, I'm still doing my part. I'm sorry, you guys are doing your part, but like, this is what I gotta do. So, you know, again, these tough decisions people are making and we'll see, you know, like we're in, we're in it. Like we're at the, um, begin to middle part of harvest right now like barely into the middle so we'll see what happens but I think that the way that people can help right now if you have a wine that you've loved in the past support. and you can afford it support them so whether that's becoming a club member even if it's just for one round of being a club member that is extremely helpful and useful to people if there's a winery that you've loved if you've liked any of the wines we've tasted today order those wines to be shipped to you. They'll come right in time for Thanksgiving. Um, 
<laughs> so you can have that Thanksgiving love. You know? <clears throat> Join Cha's new wine club that will be open. Join the be- wine <laughs> club over here. Maybe. <laughs> I'm like, just order through me. <laughs> yeah. There you go. If you I'm like, help, low key promo thing. drop. Right. So, no, yeah, seriously, uh, but that's the way that people media. need to think of. Yeah, social media as a tool is also about if you see something or you know someone who's doing something really great, the idea of social media in my mind is to share. The right. more people share these things on their posts, in their stories, the more people know about it. Right. And maybe you can't afford to join the club or maybe you can't afford to purchase the wine, but somebody else can. Or maybe it's a thing where the three people get together and you guys share the cost and then you guys can share that wine together in a COVID safe fashion during Thanksgiving. I don't know, but there's tons of ways to be supportive. And when it comes down to it, I'm going to need your money. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, I I, I, listen, I love that you gave three, you know, that's, that's how my mind processes. Here are three things that I can tell my readers, my followers. So that that's great. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Salute, dress is important. Always. Right. Good, uh, better, best. Um, so, being lo- a, big, a, a big long table with pork belly, with some risottos, with duck, with all these things that we spoke about, like with great wines and we all share and mm-hmm. perhaps some politicians could hear us and make better decisions too. Yeah, we'll see yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, this is why we go live on YouTube. So it can be replayed. We're going to go viral. This is our stance. <laughs> this is yeah. <laughs> Go We're about home. to go into two hours. Go We're about to go into we are. Hours. And I didn't even ask my question. You already know. So, <laughs> but let me just say a moment about Salud. Um, I've been doing a lot of research about them. And that's the great part about me doing United We Taste because it forces me to dive deep, literally without traveling. And that's, you know, I know Siobhan, you and I have a special place with uh, connecting to the countries that we bring Mm-hmm. tours to and host people in so in this case this is a this has been a nice way to do that too and so Oregon knowing that this was going to be Oregon learning more about Salud and then knowing that the Spire collection actually supports Salud it, it, it has made everything come into place so we'll definitely uh, make sure whatever post that we do after this we're going to tag Salud and the other one I didn't know about Siobhan just here. oh yes so we're going to make sure everyone has okay. yeah Whoever got the money, go, you know, send them some donations, call them up, see how you can help them. Because they were not, they were not brought up because of wildfires. They were, they were doing work already. So even salute with doing the COVID testings at the vineyards um, this year to make sure that the immigrant workers actually were being tested often, you know? So it was not just like we test once, but we taught, we testing as often as possible. Um, so give them the great resources to health care that they need. Uh, to be taken care of. So anybody else who is uh, following or watching this video, if you have other resources that Siobhan didn't mention or other ideas, um, just let us know and obviously supporting uh, the smaller wineries as well. So I can move on to my last question, guys. All right. People always give me the show me the money dance. So I'm always turning it up. Auntie Oprah on the end. I give everybody a nice little cash. So um, Bruno is, is more than familiar with using my money, as I mentioned earlier. So in this case, I am granting you, all lovely people, the moment of a lifetime. Siobhan's already thinking hard about this because she's already started making wine, but she cannot use the grapes that she used already. You can plant any grape in Oregon, but you cannot plant any of the grapes they're known for, meaning you cannot plant Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, uh, Syrah in the North, et cetera. I don't know if you need more boundaries on that, but just know the top seven grapes of the area you can't plant. But I'm giving you the money to plant whatever grape you want. Tell me which grape and why. Whoever uh, want to go first, go right ahead. I'll go first. Siobhan, you cannot use any of the grapes you're using now. Um, I <laughs> would get a new grape from somewhere else. <laughs> so. Uh, that's so fine. I'll go. I'll go. I I would be interested to see how Nero, Nerello Mascalese does, uh, just because of the vo- volcanic soils. Uh, it's one of my favorite grades because I fucking love Mount Etna. Sorry, I don't know if we're able to curse or not, but I just. Girl, this is HBO. <laughs> it's 2020, yeah. baby. Girl, <laughs> curse. It's just 2020. Sure. Yeah, it's 2020. I know. We sometimes we need to drop f bombs, but um, yeah, I. I think that would be really 
interesting to see how it does. Obviously, the climates are very different, but I mean, I think like high elevations are definitely there in Oregon. So mm -hmm. I, I think that that would be interesting. I guess I like you go step back and actually give more people context about the great that you well, have. yeah, I would I would just so. be interested to see like how it would do because I personally don't know. I don't know of any like Rillo planted outside of Italy. I'm sure maybe there is, but I, I personally don't know it. Um, but, you know, and just because of like and I'll admit like I just got back from a West Coast trip. I was in and I actually met up with Trevon for the first time in, in, in Oregon when I was there, which is really awesome. And but the, the thing that I took away from Oregon, like Siobhan said earlier, like that it is really the wild, wild west and like people are planting everything Whatever. you yeah. can imagine, you know, I mean, I toured like Johan Vineyard and like they have like I think it was like 16 different I think it's 11 or 16 different varieties there. A lot of them being, you know, Savoie, you know, like Austrian varietal, like it's just amazing. And so like, I, I just think that there's so much experimentation in there uh, and creativity. I think that you can really kind of like, you can do I'm whatever you, you to, want I would to go. bring your own expression. Yeah, That's but I, I, but again, but I think that like, it would be interesting to see that grape and how it would do. Oh. I would go more towards gonna... that altitude thing that it just said, like with the Savoie and everything and yeah. Austrians. Yeah. Like for me, like I, I think more like fairly Friulian red varietals like Rufusco, Legrand. Rufusco is amazing. Rufusco High altitude, and Legrand, like... It, it's like from, uh, and I got to taste some expressions of that. I, I like it. Finger eating, Lakes eating, do, is doing eating. well already. Uh, hold on, let me, let me bring my like Tom buzzer here. All right, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> Okay, because now you're turning it. into the Bruno. Uh, I know. Oh, I guess when every time we talk about Friuli, like any of that, like I get really excited. I'm sorry. Like Rafael, no, no. Schio, like, Patino, no, very, are my wines. They're, they're great. Very but briefly, I would say, I would say first and foremost, like I will, of course, I would go with the Portuguese varietal. I would go with Alvarinho. It's not that there's huh? no Alvarinho in the region. Well, but there the is, reason though. is yeah, no, no, but it's there is now. Alvarinho. There no, is I'll Alvarinho. You, I accept it. But <laughs> Alvarinho, I would say in the meantime, <laughs> I would say Alvarinho, why? Because Siobhan just said that and keeps saying about uh, Oregon, it's mm -hmm. resilient. Alvarinho, it's one grape, no wonder why the French in Bordeaux are adapting. Alvarinho can fight diseases, is a yeah. coastal varietal, does well with the small rain shadow effect that I have in Monsanto and Malgasso in uh, Vino Verde, makes beautiful wines, can make sparklings, can, it's, it's a great for blending. Alvarinho is just great. But mm -hmm. yes, I would go with Italian varietals from the Friuli, mm -hmm. Because the same thing they just said, 11 grapes on the same plot, that's mm -hmm. it, that's Friuli. It's yeah. a shit ton of grapes. That's it's amazing. It's all over there. Yeah. And it's just like right. high, they need high in acidity and all these mm -hmm. kind of things. And the Finger Lakes is already doing that. They are. I think a little bit. They're playing with- Red uh, Tail, Red, varieties. yeah, Red Tail. Red Tail Ridge. It's amazing. Red Tail Ridge. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm Who done. Who else? Come okay. on, Siobhan. So, Ready? Oh. Okay. Ahead, I'm going to say, Siobhan, I have no idea if this would work, um, but I have a personal obsession with Viognier. Mm. So, that's why I didn't know. I did not know. I've never had a Viognier from Oregon. So, okay. who's in the, the, yeah, in the South and in the, um, you, you can find oh, Viognier. Okay. Okay. But you can, I mean, I'll hear your VNA, but we'll take a, a second. But one of the, just let me just go over like the main ones that we have here. So okay. Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, um, Riesling, and what else? Oh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. So those okay. ones I should stay far away from. VNA I take, but if you have a close second, I'll let, let's see. Let's see. Maybe with the did five ones. Okay. Only because you said Riesling, then I'm like, how about let's try Gewurztraminer? Oh, there's courage. Oh, shit. You know what? There's I don't courage. know. <laughs> <laughs> all the yeah, aromatic. <laughs> okay, it's so, really the wild, wild west, man. Crazy. It's basically you may be all the, first the aromatic person varietals. I have not horrible. given no money to. <laughs> Give me no money. I tried, though. I, I came in you with the <laughs> Well, actually, they were saying, I think the last count from when I was reading too, it was like 82 different varietals. So it's going to be said, you're not going to find one that's like not there at all. Okay. But just kind of, as long as it's not one of the main ones. So, I, I mean, I heard your first choice. Which that's is okay. I'm okay with no money. I, I tried, though. I tried. <laughs> no, the Viognier. Um, Either like uh, the little 
sound from the game shows. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. That's a, this is also a call for somebody to like edit all my videos so I can get all the voices, okay? That would be good. Uh, so Siobhan <laughs> is being last. Yes. So my great choice does exist in Oregon, but not enough. Okay. Uh, and it's called Gara Noir. Oh. So, okay. Yeah. You heard it here okay. first. <laughs> Heard it here first. <laughs> Gara Noir is a grape that was, uh, uh, it's a hybrid grape that was invented in Switzerland by a man named Andre Jacquinet. Mm. And it's a hybrid of Gamay Noir and I'm going to mispronounce it. Hey, right, like, here for you. Can you something? What it? Um, Reich, it's Reichensteiner, which okay. is a white wine yeah. grape. So Gamay Noir and then Reichensteiner, which is a white wine grape that's uh, related to Müller Thurgau. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Thurgau. And, they together, and they made yeah, they made Gara Noir. Mm -hmm. And it's by this guy, Andre Jacquinet and some other obscure person. But it is the most beautiful combination of Gamay and this, whatever this other like Müller turgau ish white wine grape together, but it's a red wine grape. And right now, the only person who's making that is um, uh, Jeff Veer from Golden Cluster. And it's he has a wine called Merci André Jacquinet, and it's the Gara Noir. It is the most, mm -hmm. like, juicy, I could just drink, drink, drink. But it has, oh. like, this beautiful, like, chocolates and uh, berries, and it is so good. And there's only one person growing it right now in Oregon, or now. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, it's funny it because that's so a good. it's funny how they both went this well bruno if he was going to use a uh, uh, portuguese grape that's that's expected right so we're, we're okay with that we accept this the, <laughs> but but then we have one italian grape and he agrees with you with italian siobhan i was thinking the same thing i i was actually tapping into uh germany and i was like i think i went the riesling route like in my mind like okay but Riesling's there. Pinot, no, 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 no. Meaning my thought process. My thought process got you. Okay. Yeah, right. So we got like Riesling and we got Pinot and I love German uh, spot Burgunder. I love Riesling. And so I was like, maybe we'll do a nice La Frankish. And that's when I was, I thought this may work yes. well. It exi it's there. It's there. Not at large it's there. levels. You can, not, at large, but but not at large levels. Actually, they're grow not at large levels, but in Johan Veneer, they're planting La Frankish there. Yeah, we have black uh, there, there, there. No, no, That's but I see, I see what you say. I see what you say. Finger yeah, no, 100%. Finger there doing I the think it would be, <laughs> but you're totally right. Like, it's There's a moment. perfect there. Like, I think this is the climate it needs. Absolutely. I think instead of trying yeah. to, like, be France and all this other stuff, no, what they should have did was try to be Germany. Even yeah. Spiegel. Yeah. Even Spiegel. Yeah, you're this so right. Mark, this, uh, I can't remember who it is. It's going to come to me, but someone is doing, someone is, someone this year, Oh my God, how can I not remember this? I'm so sorry. Okay, <laughs> no, I'm it's fine. fine but, it's but someone is doing a Blau Frankish Nouveau this year. <gasps> okay, mic drop for that. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. I, oh my God, who is it? Oh. But you know why you can't remember? Because it's me. This year, someone's oh making God. that. Like okay, that. Siobhan, when you remember, it, tell me so I can buy it. Oh, and tell all of us, put it on your Instagram. Tag all of us, tag United. Oh, Harmonic Conservation, Fresh, blah, blah, blah. Oh. But they're doing it with Black Frankish. Black so Frankish okay. will be a dream from Oregon. Ooh. I'm glad, I'm whoever thought to start I'm looking at Burgundy, remember. that's cute. But I do a lot of no. my virtual wine tasting <laughs> from here. <laughs> that's cute. That's cute. Yeah, because I thought, oh, people can't afford. I want to compare old world to new world, right? When I'm doing yeah. my tasting, just educationally. And so for me, I don't want to take them to the Burgundy and have to spend all this money. So I take them to Oregon and then take them to Germany. And I use the people are like, why Germany? And I'm like, this no, is what dude. you need to understand. You need to understand spot Burgundy from different and areas. And German, right? yeah. German and then red you can pick up why Oregon and Germany uh, Pinots, a little bit more context that plays the same. We have the, uh, the river, so we have the water influence mm -hmm. that's fresh and right there. So for me, Blau Frankish is going to be my jam. And I think that when I would it just comes, say that perhaps I was thinking about a needs, I, would just say that, I would just say that perhaps Blau Frankish needs a lot of attention because it's, it's fairly it's prone to diseases and coastal. Yeah. 
I do know because I'm feeling your dream. I know, feeling your dream. He's like, no, 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 because, no, 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 because <laughs> I ask these questions a lot of times to, to the producers that I talk to, like, if you had to go, like, someplace in the world and plant this outside of the box, like, you do your own project, you want to, you don't want to do what your parents are doing with your winery, what would you do? Like, I would do this and this and this, but, but guess what? Like, I love that grip, but that grip needs a lot of work. It's like, I'm not getting the same yields. We're not getting this and this and this, but I totally get you. Like, the Blanc Frankish, like, Finger Lakes are doing that. Like, I totally get mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I also to like, don't have me start wine. talking about New York wines. So yeah. 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 that's gonna be that's gonna be its own yeah. night yeah. that we taste. We'll talk about we got, okay when you do the New York ones. Can I be on the Finger Lakes? Boom, done. There. She's there. She's already back there. For that. She's coming back. That'll be fun. Right, Bruno, you they, fun. Look, we push. We're about to beat Portugal on time, so we gotta go. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. <laughs> Right, you should know when you have here. a panel with me, I'm a Thank talker. So Everyone who is who stayed on with us, I don't know for this two hours. I don't we didn't even ask if y'all had <laughs> questions, but I'm sure if y'all had something pressing, y'all would have said it this way. Um, thank you all for joining us. This will you can replay it, share it with your friends and everything like that, so they can listen to us like dive deep into Oregon, mm -hmm. listen to uh, a local, get into her story uh, on the winemaking side as well as living there and ways that you can help out at this uh, at this trying moment, okay? So yeah, don't don't believe the hype. The smoke tank shouldn't stop you from buying Oregon wines or California wines. If it's out there, someone tried it and blessed it for to be on the shelf. So trust trust that idea, okay? So cheers to everyone. Thank you guys cheers. for joining me. Cheers. Thank you. It's so much fun. Thank you. Thank you.